Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Rebel Clash, go ahead and check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code Omnipoke. For today's video, we are going over a guide to investing in the Pokemon trading card game. Now, investing has become much more of a hot topic as of late, seeing as though prices have started to make a bit of a jump in recent months. A lot of people are speculating in this field, there's more attention being brought to it, and there's a multitude of factors around that, we're going to talk about that today, but it does seem as though there's a lot of new content out there right now, people are looking towards this sort of field, uh, collectors and people who aren't even involved in the Pokemon trading card game hobby at all are starting to take note. Even Gary Vanderchuk has mentioned casually in a few of his streams that Pokemon cards are on fire right now. So a quick introduction to myself. My core background is in collecting Pokemon cards. I have been doing this since 2009 when I got back into the hobby. I was also, you know, a 90s kid and was doing it in the playgrounds when I was five and six years old and with you know over 12 years of collecting under my belt I have amassed quite a large collection in various different areas in Pokemon so this is more so going to be from the side of a collector's perspective rather than an investor's perspective but over the last two or three years as prices have started to climb I've had to evolve my own strategies into becoming a more engaged and financially stable collector as I go. So I'm hoping this can um, be a video that's helpful to all sorts of different people. Let's talk about what I mean by investing. Investing in Pokemon for me is simply purchasing Pokemon cards or products with the expectation of seeing long-term growth in value for your overall collection or the things that you have stockpiled. This video is hopefully going to be useful for those of you looking to diversify your investment portfolio within a high risk speculative pop culture collectible market. I'll break all those things down in a moment. Um, whilst also identifying the safest and best value options within this market. I'm hoping it can be helpful for existing Pokemon trading card game collectors like myself who are trying to complete their collection goals in a more financially minded way. Also, I'm hoping this video can help those of you who have simply dug up your Pokemon cards from your childhood and you're looking to find out how much they can go for in today's market. So first of all, let's get a deeper understanding of the Pokemon trading card game. For any investment in the world, uh, no matter what, no matter how much money you have, you first must gain a good core knowledge of the thing that you're looking to plant your money into because the most informed decisions are going to be the ones that are most successful uh, as you navigate your investment portfolio. So first we've got to figure out what's going on with Pokemon. We'll first talk about the Pokemon brand and how it compares to other pop culture collectibles. We'll talk about the market demographic and segmentation within the market. We'll look at the different investment avenues that are possible within the Pokemon trading card game. We'll talk about key influencers and voices within the Pokemon TCG market and specifically the investment spheres of this market. We'll talk about the importance of condition and grading services, as well as talking about the actual rarity breakdown and the discussion on scarcity for the Pokemon trading card game as well. Let's start off with the brand identity. And this is just a blanket statement that many Pokemon collectors within the hobby like to say. Pokemon is the highest grossing media franchise with over $90 billion of revenue. While this is a fact, it does not mean that Pokemon trading cards are that popular. The Pokemon brand is absolutely monstrous, there's no denying that, but this is divided up between many different avenues. There's the anime, there's films, there's toys, there's plushies, there's Pokemon Go, there's Pokemon trading card game online. There's the cards themselves, and there's a ton of video games, not just the mainline games, a ton of other games out there as well. So I always like to think about the Pokemon trading card game market as a large funnel. There's this monster, monster brand that has a ton of people that care about it. And then there's a handful of people who then collect the cards. Then there's a handful of people who still collect the cards today. And as you can see, the funnel gets lower and lower. Some people only really know the names of Pikachu, Charizard, and a handful of other things, whereas some people are fully engrossed with the hobby. 
let's have a look at some other pop culture collectibles now this is something that I believe is helpful to you if you are looking to invest in Pokemon cards seriously to also compare it to competitors in the market as well as things that can act similarly and differently. Pokemon is a very new investment category. It's only been around for 20 or so years. So comparing that to the likes of Magic the Gathering as well as sports cards, it is really in infancy. It's got a similar timeline to the Yu-Gi-Oh! training card game, and I think that's also worth looking into in the sort of price range that you can get for the sort of top-tier collectibles within that collect uh, collecting category. Also looking at more established pop culture collectibles, like um, Atari-graded games, as well as uh, comic books as well. Comic books, you know, can go back a few more years than uh, trading cards for the most part, but they are still a pop culture collectible for sure. There's a ton of toys that can also be graded. I think Star Wars action figures are a great one to look into. They have a similar sort of pull in terms of the popularity of the brand itself compared to Pokemon, although it is a little bit smaller, surprisingly. Um, but sort of seeing how that market interacts is also interesting, as well as things like Lego and Funko Pops most recently. I don't think you need to become an expert in any of these fields, but being aware of the maybe top 1-5% to 5 of these categories is certainly worth looking into. The prices that are sort of banded around in those different spheres, as well as the prices of like the more general collectibles, you know, because not every single Pokemon card is going to be worth a ton of money in the future. Usually it's only the highest percent, you know, the top 1-10% to 10 of um, collectibles within any category is worth anything, and a bunch of things are worth zero, so <laughs> that's something to bear in mind. But that zero could mean, you know, less than a dollar. It could mean less than $20. It could mean less than $100, depending on what sort of sphere we're talking about. So looking into these other pop culture collectibles are certainly something that I believe is important. So you can get a good range of where Pokemon sort of sits against these things in terms of pricing. Does it mean that they're sort of um, overinflated right now in comparison? Is it even the best option for a pop culture collectible in this era? Uh, that may be the case that... Pokemon's not even the best when you compare it to these other things. Pokemon's something that I simply enjoy collecting. It doesn't mean that it's the most financially stable, secure, or has the highest rewards compared to some of these other alternatives. So definitely something to bear in mind. However, let's take things back to Pokemon now and start talking about the demographic. This is something I see a lot of people mention, and it's pretty obvious, really. 90s kids was where it all started for the Pokemon trading card game. The uh, video games came out in the US in 1998, the anime came out in 1997, the original uh, Indigo League anime, and the English base set came uh, around in January of 1999. So this really is catching people of an age demographic today of around, you know, 25 to 35. I've given you a nice medium uh, um, earnings calculator for each uh, person within this sort of category of 18 to 36 to give you a good idea of the earnings that people are getting and as you can see the graph says that the median earnings on average goes up as you get older so a lot of people like to note this i know personally i'm uh, 25 going 26 and i earn a lot more today than i did when i was 18 and even more than i did when i was 14 that's for certain and a lot of people like to jump on this market demographic and look at the overall age and say that even if the market size doesn't get much larger, the buying power of each individual who are still engaged in this hobby is still going up. So that could be a good indicator that prices will rise. Now, that's just something that's banded around. It's not necessarily my opinion, but it is something to bear in mind. Also, it could cause rapid um, expansion of prices, potentially similar to those that we've seen recently if the market size grows in addition to the fact that buying power for each person is increasing not only that but cards are still being released shows are still coming out you can see that video games sword and shield was released in 2019 um, so there's still new people being introduced pokemon to pokemon for the first time which also suggests that the brand is strong and has staying power for a number of years we're not talking about things like stamps, which have gone out of fashion for a number of years now as a collectible item. Pokemon is still talked about. You can still go across the counter and buy some booster packs. It's still in the minds of people today. 
Another thing I want to mention just quickly, looking again between that age demographic of 18 to 34 year olds, similar to the one to the side here, just looking at the sort of media interaction that people have on average. A lot of the time it's um, web usage that uh, a lot of people in this age demographic spend their free time on compared to the likes of radio and television. So when we're talking about the influencers on this market, it's definitely important to look online to see where most people are absorbing their content um, because that can be a real indication for what people are looking at, what trends they will follow and who ultimately they are taking advice from. Let's also talk about the market mentality and segments. Within the Pokemon trading card game market, there are a number of eyes looking in on this. There are competitive players, um, there are collectors only interested in um, products themselves and don't even know the rules to the trading card game. There are people who are purely investment based. There are those who are trying to be opportunistic, necess not necessarily looking to invest for the long term, but are looking for short term flip opportunities, maybe even opportunities of arbitrage, which is a real dirty word in a lot of people's eyes, but is completely fair game in an open market, in my opinion. And there's also just the demographic of children who usually are collectors, usually are, you know, sometimes playing the game. But I like to separate this because oftentimes the mindset of a child uh, in terms of protection of their cards, for example, might be quite different to those of higher age demographics. So definitely something to bear in mind. Within these segments, there's all sorts of different categories. So you can have all sorts of different players. You can have all sorts of different investors. You can have all sorts of different collectors like I've mentioned here. Within this collector category, there are those who only are interested in sealed products, only interested in c completing sets whenever they are released. Maybe they're only interested in Wizards of the Coast sets. Uh, maybe there are people who collect certain species. So whenever a new Chansey card comes out, they are looking specifically for that card and want to get all of those ever printed. There are those just trying to complete a binder. Maybe they're looking to complete the Pokedex of the original 151 and just want to find their favorite artwork. Um, all sorts of different ways you can try and organize binders and there is more and more increasingly going to be graded collectors PSA BGS and some of these other companies that I'll be talking about later Certainly do have um, a foothold in the Pokemon trading card game market Now although I have put these little five segments out there Obviously, this isn't going to be talking about the percentages of each of those It's down to you guys to figure out what those percentages are, but also be aware that People don't identify as just one of these things. Oftentimes it's a crossover. There are people who play and collect. There are people who collect and invest. There are children who also keep their cards very well in binders and whatnot. And uh, yeah, there's all sorts of different crossovers. And when we're talking about demand later on and the importance of demand on how that drives price, knowing that certain items may cross over across a number of these different segments of the market can also be a big reason why there is such high demand in certain items for example a charizard card is synonymous with children because he's powerful strong and he's a cool fire breathing dragon he's also synonymous with collectors because it takes us back to the original base set charizard as does investors because some of the highest um priced cards in the hobby at least set cards will be charizards so there is that big crossover between all sorts of people in the hobby everyone cares about charizard and that is often why the demand is so high on that particular species of pokemon now let's talk about the different investment avenues within pokemon i kind of made this um to look quite daunting and to make it pretty tricky for you guys to figure out what's going on because this is simply a demonstration that Within the last, um, you know, 25 or so years, Pokemon has come out with all sorts of different trading card game products. And it's really down to you guys in how much research you want to put in to figure out what's going to be the best investment. There is honestly so much to go through from sealed packs, weighed packs, uh, sealed boxes, sealed cases, uh, loose cards, loose promo cards, Japanese versus English, modern versus vintage. Uh, set collecting, binder collecting, um, grading your cards, what that all means. Uh, there's so much to absorb in the Pokemon trading card game that you really, really do need to do your research. Like I say, I think the easiest place to start is start with whatever base you do know, whether it's that you've started or you, you've come back into the hobby after 
um, enjoying this when you're a child and you felt nostalgic, you could go back to that original era, uh, which is known as the Wizards of the, of the Coast era, which is around this sort of range where base set, jungle, fossil, and um, Team Rocket all sort of lie. There's also the second generation, the Neo series. Uh, then we move on to the first EX era, the takeover from Wizards of the Coast to the Pokemon Training, uh, sorry, the Pokemon Company and the Pokemon Company International. The Diamond and Pearl era, so Gen 4, Black and White era, XY era, Sun and Moon era, and even the Sword and Shield era has just started in um, combination with the video game line that's just come out. All of this stuff, this is absolute years, you know, this goes back to 1999, um, the base set, and it goes all the way to today, and even um, in the next month we'll be getting uh, Darkness Ablaze, so there are still sets being released. And all of this just falls within English set cards, so trying to be aware of the pull cards, the uh, pull rates, the chases, uh, the... Uh, rarity, the scarcity, the prices on all of these cards. That is a lot of research, but let me tell you, this is just one section of the Pokemon trading card game market. If you just take this out of the whole bubble, this is just one thing. There's all of the Japanese side for the set cards, there's Japanese promos, there's English promos, like I said, there's sealed, there's all this other stuff. So you really, really do need to brush up on all this if you want to um, really make the best decisions possible. Now let's talk about influencers in the market. Like I mentioned earlier, looking at the age demographic of 18 to 34 year olds, most people are spending a lot of their time on the web. And that means a lot of people are watching YouTube videos and um, are following forums and blogs. I think the most common and the best option of a collector forum in the Pokemon world is the Elite Four Forum. I've been on there for a number of years and um, it's full of very dedicated, very knowledgeable collectors, and they could pretty much get you an answer on anything that you ask uh, from my experience, uh, and in pretty rapid time as well. So that is certainly a resource that you might want to take your own questions to, um, as well as um, sort of absorb some knowledge, and also gain, gain a perspective from the core collector side of this hobby, because they certainly are a big pillar that is holding up the Pokemon trading cards and uh, holding up their value because ultimately collectors are buying into this hobby as much if not more than investors themselves. There's also the voice of Rudy from Alpha Investments. Although he is predominantly a um, Magic the Gathering based channel, he often will uh, put in a sprinkle of Pokemon content and ultimately his videos are so popular that he is one of the bigger voices in Pokemon without being a Pokemon guy. So definitely take on board what he's saying and what his opinions are because ultimately people want to follow other people. People want to um, have sort of a herd mentality. They like feeling good if someone agrees with them and they also look for, you know, other people's quests and other people's opinions on things because they're also gaining knowledge a lot of the time. SM Pratt, again, one of the oldest voices in the game. He, I believe, was the person who even started the Elite Four Forum. He has an awesome YouTube channel, which again is full of great information, great investment information, as well as collecting information. So certainly a resource that I recommend. Gem Mint Pokemon, one of the OG channels to do with grading cards. Certainly a great way, a great opportunity with arbitrage in the Pokemon uh, world is with grading. Um, Pokerev, an up and coming opening channel. I'm not going to go through all of these, but definitely stuff to bear in mind. Silver Snorlax, again, another grading channel from way back when. Poker Soup grading also. Um, there's a bunch of very, very popular opening channels. These are usually the ones that get the most views. So we've got Darien's Pokemon, Primetime Pokemon, Laughing Pikachu, Real Breaking Nate, Unlisted Leaf, Max Mofo. Uh, we've got Leon Hart, Lootbox TV, a more recent one. These are all channels that really just sit there opening packs. Typically, these are targeting a lower age audience compared to the, some of the stuff down here, which is really the up and coming channels, I would say, um, because there seems to be more and more of an interest in investing and collecting as the age demographic. Once again, uh, we go back to that little thing that I mentioned earlier, as age ranges sort of grow, as people start earning an income, becoming more financially aware, 
um, start dipping their toe into investing into their own portfolios in the stock market. It becomes more of an intrigue um, in our adult lives to start looking at Pokemon in a similar vein. So I believe some of these YouTube channels, which although don't have many views right now, most of them sit you know, under the 10K mark for the most part. I certainly do see this field becoming more saturated and more popular overall. So there's a ton of voices out there right now talking about this stuff and it is getting a decent amount of interest. Although I do think investing is still quite the hot topic and you could still be one of the first out there because like I said, less than 10,000 people are subscribed to the majority of these investment and collecting channels. A lot of them, you know, sub 5K even. So if you can be sort of first out the gate, um, you can still um, not be sort of too late into the investing where you're just relying on the greater fool theory that someone's going to buy a card for more than you bought for because at the moment investing is still young in the hobby I would say uh, for sure. Let's talk about condition. This isn't just the case for Pokemon trading cards. This is important for pretty much any um, collecting category. Condition is absolutely king. You can notice straight away just from this one example. These were auctions that ended on the same date, the 22nd of May 2020, and it's the same card. Uh, it was a Charizard card that sold on the left for one pound with one bid, and then the one on the right is the exact same Charizard card from the same set, but it's a little bit less battered. It's actually in uh, mint, gem mint condition as graded by a third party PSA. And that card has gone for substantially more than the one on the left. So that should tell you everything you need to know. And this is at the point where you may be starting to feel a little bit bad if you've just looked at your childhood cards and thought that they look more like the ones on the left than the ones on the right. I've got some bad news for you it probably means your cards are not going to have that same value that you were told on those click here now sort of websites where it's telling you that your Charizard card from, you know, 20 years ago is worth $50,000. It's probably not going to be the case unless somehow you kept it in great condition all those years ago. Let's talk about grading in a little bit more detail now. Um, Beckett or BGS and PSA are certainly the two most popular choices in the Pokemon trading card game hobby and really it's leaning most towards the PSA side of things. If you just look at the bottom of these two Mewtwo cards here, there is almost 35,000 search results on eBay for PSA Pokemon cards and there's just under 2,000 for BGS. So. PSA really does have the lion's share here. They are the most popular grading service uh, for Pokemon cards. Now that may change, but as of right now, it definitely feels like PSA cards is where most of the market leans towards for their grading. Let's talk about grading in a bit more detail. As you can see, Beckett cases give you one large grade at the top here and also have four subgrade categories where they give you um, notations on what they are. Overall, this is a Mint 9 Mewtwo. Beckett grades up to 10, but they grade up to 10 on these four different options. And as you can see, they also provide 0.5 grades in all of these categories. So if you were to get 10s in all four of these categories, it would have a black label and would be considered a pristine 10. Um, if it didn't have all four, if it wasn't a quad 10, it would be called um, a... Uh, gem mint uh, 10 instead. There's also BGS 9.5s. This is a BGS 9 and it essentially tallies up the um, the four categories and it denotes it as mint. For PSA it's a much simpler grading scale. It's a 1 to 10 scale. It does have 0.5 grades but they are used much more sparingly than BGS. They do not show subgrades, but you can check out their website to see what they are looking for when they are grading your cards. So certainly, certainly something to bear in mind. Another quick note, they do not offer 9.5 grades. It is only the 0.5s from below the mint grade, which is 9. Let's talk about uh, the rarity from booster packs. Obviously, the majority of Pokemon cards come from booster packs. Now, there are a ton of promotional releases, but for the most part, it's ripped open from uh, booster packs where you have a random chance of different things 
uh, in each of them. So in each pack, you are going to find, at least uh, in this example of Evolutions, where it has 10 additional game cards, there has been different eras with a different number of cards per booster pack, so do bear that in mind. But for the most part, you're going to see these three different rarities. You're going to see Commons, which are denoted by a circle in the bottom corner, Uncommons, which is a diamond in the bottom corner, and Rare Cards, which is a star in the bottom corner. Common cards you normally find between four and five per pack. Uncommons, usually three per pack. You'll notice as well there are trainer cards. Usually these follow the same rules where they are no more or less rare, but just bear in mind that trainer cards are also a thing uh, that you can pull from packets, not just the physical Pokemon themselves. Trainers are usually integral to uh, the player side of the game, so you actually can sometimes find value in these trainer cards, so something to bear in mind. And ultimately, they are still part of a set, so set collectors will still need to pick up a copy of these. You can see one per pack is for rare cards. Now, this isn't always the case because a one in three will be a holographic card, and that will take the space of a regular rare card. So you're expecting a rare in every single pack, but one of them sometimes or can be a holographic rare, which is a one in three odds. Uh, so something to bear in mind is a it's a slightly rarer version and you can see the background is holographic also in every pack uh, there are reverse holographic cards um, these can have the common uncommon and rare symbols in the bottom right it is a random chance um, so they also have a slightly different pull rate to the ones shown above there are also tons of secret rare uh, options and ultra rares within the Pokemon trading card game. This can differ between different sets and different eras, so something to bear in mind. But just to give you an example of this Evolutions booster pack, one in 12 packs, you could get um, regular half art EX cards, and one in 18 packs, you can get full art EX cards as well. So something to bear in mind. Throughout the Pokemon trading card game, there's been a ton of secret rare, ultra rare versions um, from old EXs, which were lowercase EX cards, uh, gold stars, level Xs, um, secret rares, crystals, um, full art GX, hyper rare rainbow GX cards. I'm just throwing out words right now, but they're all things that you could research. And remember, whenever you're buying a booster pack, it's important to know what you can get inside of them. Let's also talk about the importance of scarcity and pull rates. So we talked about rarity in the previous slide, but scarcity can sometimes be something completely different. And also be aware that official rarity of cards isn't the full story. For example, these two cards from the Diamond and Pearl era, this Gardevoir Level X is a uh, Secret Wonders card, and this Cresselia Level X, both the same rarity, both with the same borders. In theory, you'd think they would have the same pull rate. This Cresselia is from Grey Encounters, by the way. But they actually do not. In fact, the Cresselia is twice as difficult to pull than the Gardevoir Level X. Uh, in both of these sets, Level X cards were at a one per box ratio. But the difference here is there were only two Level X cards available in Secret Wonders, meaning that Gardevoir you usually get in one in two boxes. For the Cresselia, it was one of four Level X cards. So you would get it in one in four boxes on average. So even though these cards have the same official rarity, they are not always equal. So that's something that, again, you could research, take advantage of as well. If prices don't make sense, if these cards were selling at a similar price, that could be a reason why you could find some value, for example. But there are plenty of other factors that go into a price of a card, not just the rarity itself. We can talk about that in a bit more detail now when we compare some Mew cards. This is a Mew from Expedition. Uh, this is part of the Wizards of the Coast era. I believe it was back in 2001 or 2002 that this card was printed. Comparing it to a much more modern Unbroken Bonds Mew as well as a Promo Mew. Once again from that Wizards of the Coast era. Let's first compare some things here. An Expedition Booster Box recently sold for $9,340. So a pretty decent chunk of change when you compare it to a more modern Unbroken Bonds Box which sold for $250 recently. <coughs> Even then, Unbroken Bonds retails at around $80, and that was only a couple years ago, so certainly something to bear in mind. Now you'll notice that the uh, ratios down here, in terms of how many packs you would have to open on average to get 
either of these Mew cards is pretty similar. And in fact, this Mew is technically more difficult to pull if you're opening packs if they were all equal. However, the cost of trying to pull this uh, Expedition Mew is substantially more, seeing as though you would have to open multiple Expedition boxes, um, and when you tot that all up compared to Unbroken Bonds, it's a no-brainer that this is much more difficult to acquire. That leads me on to the next thing, Population Reports. These pop reports are based on PSA, that most popular grading service that we've talked about. They have a fantastic website where you can navigate and look at uh, different designations of cards and how many are in their set registry. Basically, how many cards that they have graded and what those grades are. You can see currently there are 23 PSA 10s uh, for this Expedition Mew card, and there are only 17 PSA 10s for the Unbroken Bonds Mew. Um, and this is kind of a misleading thing. You would think that, well, surely the Unbroken Bonds Mew is uh, more valuable because it's harder to pull and at the same time there's less PSA 10s. But that's not always the case. Like I said, the opportunity cost of trying to get this Expedition Mew, get more of these in a high grade, basically if you're going to get this in a PSA 10, it's a very off chance that you can find a raw copy of this because it's so old for a high enough standard to get a PSA 10. So it pretty much means you're only ever able to get it from booster packs. And boxes are so expensive that these are not done very often outside of investors trying to break the box and sell individual packs to people. Or um, if there are philanthropists out there that don't care about the money anymore or hoarded the box years ago and simply want to open it for the fun. That leads me to believe that the PSA 10 report of Expedition Mew is going to go up substantially slower than the Unbroken Bonds copy, seeing as though this box was printed um, not even a year ago, I don't think, uh, possibly a couple years ago. Um, and the population is so low right now, but this goes back to incentive. A PSA 10 of the Unbroken Bonds Mew recently sold for $60 compared to the um, $2,500 of the Expedition Mew. So that really believe, uh, leads me to believe that there's not much incentive to grade this Unbroken Bonds Mew for a lot of people. Now that is a tidy profit compared to grading cost, um, but I don't think there's much opportunity for more expeditions to sort of come out the gate, whereas I think it's pretty likely that more of these Mews could start to hit the market. They're the same species, they have a relatively close uh, pull rate, but the fact is there's a lot less demand for this Unbroken Bonds Mew because people can get it themselves so easily from Unbroken Bonds packs a lot of the time. Also, we can talk about the uh, promo in the middle here. I haven't really talked about pull rates or anything from this card because it's actually come out of a promotional um, distribution. I believe it was uh, one of the leagues back in uh, the year 2000. Uh, I believe it was the August League. Might be April though, can't remember. Um, but regardless, this is a similar card to the Expedition in terms of when it was released, maybe even a little bit older. But you'll note that there's 164 in the PSA 10 pop report, which makes it substantially easier to obtain, which then reflects that price of only $811. So sometimes the pop report can be really useful. You can see that there's a ton out there. You can pretty much get one if ever you want it. They're much more likely to be available on eBay than the Expedition copy uh, because they are just far less available. So that can sometimes be a big determining factor on price, but don't believe everything on the PSA pop report because you have to look into these other factors to realize that this Unbroken Bonds Mew probably isn't actually that hard to get because of the price of opening Unbroken Bonds packs um, is just so easy that there could be a real increase in the population eventually. Uh, as incentive increases. For example, if we were to see an Unbroken Bonds Mew uh, be sold for something like $100, a lot of people could look at that, take notes, and start sending in their copies that they pulled a couple years back and have kept in binders uh, until they uh, felt it was the right time to grade. So a quick note on scarcity there and how it differs to overall rarity. Now let's talk at some fundamentals of the economics as it applies to Pokemon. So far, I've been trying to bombard you with information on the Pokemon training card game and things that are important to take note of. But now we're going to talk about some more um, general economic um, trends um, to bear in mind uh, for Pokemon and how it applies to this hobby in general. First of all, the basic rule of supply and demand. I'm sure anyone who's 
uh, done business studies or economics has seen this graph before. Very, very simple. Um, supply comes to meet demand oftentimes and it gets to an equilibrium price. So essentially, if uh, demand is very high and quantity is very low, it means the price is going to be somewhere up here. But as there's a higher supply, the price then, um, or the demand goes down because the supply can meet that demand. So the price finds an equilibrium. Equally, if there's a high supply and no demand, it's probably going to have a very low price in comparison to something with a medium supply and a slightly higher amount of demand. So as you can see, the graph can show you exactly where price meets itself. Now, this can often be something that isn't necessarily reflected in Pokemon cards. Like I said, the, um, the amount of cards out there and the different areas that you can invest in sometimes don't always make economic sense. You can think about certain cards that have a higher demand and a lower supply that sell for less than something with a higher supply um, at times. So these are things that you can try and take advantage of when bearing this golden rule in mind of supply and demand. Let's first talk about why it's good to invest in high demand items. Simply put, there's a lot more sales data out there for you, so you know what your buy price is at. You have a lot more buyer confidence that you've seen this sell multiple times for a certain price. You know that if you're going to buy at this price, you're less likely to get burned because more people have that price memory that they've bought at this price. They probably don't want to lose. They probably don't want to sell at a lower price. Um, so that gives you some stability and also a lot more data points just to look at overall to manage the growth and see how stable these items are. <clears throat> also, there's a lot higher liquidity of the asset because when it is time to sell, you know that there's demand out there. You know that people want to look for these sorts of chase cards. And again, that can be shown by the frequency of the sales data. Also, there's a lot higher chance that if the card is desirable, collectors will want to hold this item themselves. And if collectors are holding on to the item, they act very, very similarly to investors, sometimes even more rigid than investors because they basically never want to sell their cards. I've been collecting for over 10 years and I have only ever sold common bulk. So I am certainly on the hoarder side. And that can be a dream for investors because I am refusing to sell whatever I have removing it from the market. So even if there are a very high population, for example, of base set Charizards, a lot of people see that as a trophy card and they like to keep it for themselves and they wouldn't sell it. So a lot of people have that tucked away and would never even dream of selling that card. They would, you know, stop eating for a week first <laughs> before they got rid of their Charizard. So um, it really gives you some confidence that even though there are some potentially higher population cards out there, they're all held with sort of firm hands and no one is looking to pass those things on. Now let's talk about uh, low supply items and why these can also be great cards for investment. They're a lot less likely um, to be on the market. So you're not having to compete with other sellers, which is fantastic for you. It means that you have a lot more control. You have control of when you want to sell and you can set a price much more rigidly and also in terms of negotiation, you have a lot more power because you know that the opportunity may not come up again for the buyers of these cards. And um, that means that you can be in a lot more of a powerful position rather than having to um, accept whatever buyers come your way and how much they're willing to pay. You can be a lot more rigid in your position knowing that they're only going to get this opportunity from you and probably like only a handful of other people. So that can be a great thing in your favor. Also, if there is a decrease in market size, there's still so few people that need to be interested in your specific item that you can still fulfill that demand. Now, <clears throat> there's such a low number of trophy cards out there. Uh, Unicarps, uh, SSBs, Trophy Kangaskhans, uh, Number One Trainers that... You know, there needs to be a tiny, tiny percent of people actually caring in Pokemon cards um, that need to be aware of these cards in the first place to fulfill that demand because there are literally sometimes only like 10 or so in the population for these cards, sometimes even less, uh, that 
you need the entire planet to have a couple people interested to fulfill that demand. Uh, so you're a lot less worried about some volatility in the market size. For example, recently a lot of people believe that the market price has gone up because, um, or sorry, the price of Pokemon cards has gone up because the market size has increased um, because a lot of people are working from home or not working at all. They have more spare time and they're stuck, not able to travel and whatnot. So uh, they are having to keep themselves entertained at home. And what do you do? You go and play video games. You go and find your binder. You root that out. A lot of people are physically spending time at their parents' houses as well. So it can dig up their collections as of late. And that's uh, got people more interested in this hobby. So if the market was to go down uh, once uh, sort of lockdown restrictions are taken away from the planet and we can move around freely once again, um, it might mean that the size once again sort of deflates a little bit from previously. But these cards are probably not going to be affected as much in price as potentially some other ones out there because there's still that small percentage of people around um, that can fulfill this demand for sure. Also, these sorts of items are really difficult to manipulate unless it's you yourself who are manipulating the price by putting it super, super high. Um, because it's really difficult for anyone to, any one person to stockpile these items. Not only is the barrier to entry really high because price is a thing, but also it means that they're just so hard to acquire because there's so few of them and you're trying to pry them out the hands of probably some um, well-off collectors, uh, that these are really hard to keep your hands on in high quantities to really manipulate. So although every now and then someone may, you know, find something at market or below market value and believe they can sell it on for a slightly higher price in the short term, I believe those cards will eventually find their ways into collectors' hands and once again not be available on the market for the most part, meaning it's pretty difficult for these cards to, um, really be manipulated by people overall. Let's talk about opportunity cost a little bit and um, again sort of discuss the things you need to consider in sort of like a real situation on eBay. So I did a price search highest to lowest and just stopped at a random point and found some pretty high ticket items. This is a snapshot of eBay just from the other day and there's five items all for pretty much the exact same price. Now if you were wanting to park $25,000 of your money into Pokemon, you have to think if these were the only five options out there at any one day, there's there's a few things. You could wait for another day, obviously, or you could weigh up these options available and try and find the most correct option among these. Trying to come up with the most correct option amongst this BGS 10 Pidgeot, this BGS 10 Crystal Crobat, this BGS 10 Machamp First Edition Hollow, this BGS 10, two of the three legendary birds being black labels, um, or this four position only Expedition Charizard in a PSA 9. So things we have to consider. We'd have to look at the popularity of these items. This is a lot more of an abstract concept. This is more of a feeling that you get after being in the hobby for a while and also engaging with other collectors and investors. Again, listening to the opinions of the influencers in the game and where the general um, reaction is to these sorts of sets. Uh, you know, comparing Jungle to Sky Ridge, comparing uh, Black Star promos to four position only cards. These are all things that you'll have to bear in mind to try and gauge a popularity on these and the demand for these cards. Then looking at rarity and scarcity, this should be a lot more easy because you can simply go towards uh, PSA, you can go to BGS, and you can look at the population reports for the cards shown here in their different uh, conditions, how many there are of lower conditions, and uh, that sort of stuff. Also, you can look at the distribution for these different cards. The jungle, um, the first edition jungle Pidgeot and the Crobat came from booster packs. The Machamp and the uh, legendary birds did not nor did uh, the Charizard. So these are all things to bear in mind and trying to figure out the distribution of these could certainly help you out. Then you got to think about the possibility of change in the above areas uh, for these items. Do you think jungle is a hot topic right now? Do you think uh, Sky Ridge is underrated generally by the community? Do you think four position only is only a niche thing for now but could become much more popular in the future? 
these are all things, again, they're somewhat feelings, they're somewhat research. These are things to bear in mind. Not only that, but could the rarity and scarcity of these cards change? How likely is it that people will be breaking Sky Ridge booster boxes compared to breaking Jungle booster boxes? How likely is it that there could be another chunk of Black Star promos being sent in uh, compared to uh, four position only Charizards being sent in? Uh, in this example, PSA don't even grade four position only Charizards these days. They will give you a green label. Uh, or you can try and send it off to BGS, I believe. So these are all things to bear in mind. Also, of course, you're going to want to look at price histories and the recency slash frequency of these data points. Once again, if something is sort of sold uh, frequently or recently, that can certainly give you a better indication of the price of those sorts of cards, unless they're really spiky prices. Um, also, if something hasn't sold in a long time, it may be a good indication that this card is more so in hands of collectors than sellers, because all of these price tags are very high. There's an incentive to sell these cards if you don't wish to collect them. So, um, I think looking at sales data is, of course, one of the cornerstones for knowing that you can get things at a decent price. Timing within the market as well, definitely something to consider when you are investing. Now, not necessarily day trading, but being aware that Currently, Pokemon has experienced a large spike in prices almost across the board. So it's something to bear in mind. Is parking $25,000 the right thing to do today uh, when potentially the market could go down in the future or could go up in the future? So being aware of the factors that are at play within the market um, will certainly indicate when it is a good time to actually put money into it. And even if, uh, even if it's not the right time, being aware of these things and keeping money available for opportunities is certainly something to bear in mind. Now let's talk about the economies of scale as it applies to Pokemon. I think oftentimes this is most important for modern product because I think we see a lot of people buying one booster box or a handful of booster packs at shops. Um, whereas they could be a lot more efficient by buying cases of this product. Uh, if you're looking at the Alpha Investments model for Magic the Gathering, he buys pallets of boxes and sells them, um, sometimes at a premium. So something to bear in mind. You can definitely um, gauge how much you want to commit to a certain set and then buy accordingly. Don't buy in uh, sort of drips and drabs and um, waste money because essentially if you're going to end up buying these cards anyway and get committed, you're probably going to want to jump in at the deep end, get it at a better price because it also means that it's less risk of your investment at that point uh, because at the individual unit cost, if you wish to split these up, is going to be much lower. For example, if you bought a case of evolutions, you're probably going to do better off than sitting on one evolutions box because you bought a higher price because you just bought the individual one. Um, so again, you're relying on the price to go up higher than you would be if you if you had bought the case. Also, this can work in your favor for not just the cards themselves, but um, everything around those cards. Protecting your cards is obviously a big deal. We've talked about conditions. So looking at getting sleeves, binder pages, semi-rigid top loaders, all of these sorts of things, even when you're sending off to PSA themselves, send on big bulk services, uh, wait a few months, and get you know 100 200 cards to send them off all in one go compared to sending off you know like 10 every couple of weeks because again you'll be paying higher prices so economies of scale can work for you um not just with the cards themselves for sure they can also help out as a seller if you're looking to just sell one card compared to selling like a bunch of cards that you have available you could save on shipping costs you can save on ebay fees all this sort of stuff if you sell all in one go that being said, you have to be very careful of selling um, a bulk lot, especially on an auction, because people can find it difficult to extract the right value of an auction only with a handful of pictures if it's uh, multiple items all at once. So do be careful with what items you're auctioning compared to what items you're trying to put on a buy it now thing, especially if you're using eBay, Instagram, that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, selling in uh bulk quantities or selling a bunch at once can certainly help you out you can get more immediate cash all in one go uh even if it's not the same amount of cash you could get maybe for piecing out par uh, parts of your collection so that's all stuff to bear in mind let's talk about diversification i've mentioned a few other collectible categories and how potentially they can be sometimes lower risk than pokemon sometimes a better value than pokemon um, sometimes just simply more established than pokemon even if they are slower moving investments 
Um, so these are all things to bear in mind. You could add Pokemon to your portfolio if you wish, or you could simply walk away from it at the time being. That's completely up to you and your own research. I'm not here trying to push a certain set or a certain card. I'm not even trying to push Pokemon itself on you, despite this video talking all about the Pokemon trading card game and its investable qualities. However, if you are committed to Pokemon, um, you could also try diversifying within Pokemon. Now, a lot of people don't believe this is true diversification because the market does react together. We've seen this general uh, price rise hasn't just been the case for vintage cards or high grade cards. This has been a bit of a water level rise for the most part. We've seen modern boxes rise. We've even seen um, loose um, modern cards go for a higher value and binder sets have happened to auction for a higher value. So uh, we've seen ultimately the price rise all in one go over the last few months. That means we could also see all the prices fall at the same time as well in the future. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, so if you want to be truly diverse, you probably want to look towards other collectible categories um, or just other investment opportunities outside of um, asset classes or collectibles, looking towards stocks, bonds, all that sort of stuff. But if you are looking towards diversification in Pokemon, think about that modern versus vintage split, how they interact differently. Graded cards versus sealed product is definitely a big debate. Binder collections, if you're picking those up, how you're going to piece it out, how you're going to keep cards for yourself, sell some on, that sort of thing. These are all things to bear in mind as you acquire cards along the way. Now that I've talked about the economic opportunities and the things to bear in mind when collecting and investing, as well as giving you an introduction into the Pokemon market, let's talk about how you can actually start to invest. I do, again, want to stress that don't jump into this market if you don't know diddly about Pokemon, if you haven't done your research, and if you don't have a basic grasp of economics, don't start investing. I, I can't think of anything more dangerous or more risky because Pokemon is inherently speculative. It's a young, young hobby with people with a young investor mindset <laughs> because everyone is physically within that age demographic that is young. In many cases, this is our first exposure to investing and trying to hold on to things. And a lot of people have hold on, held on to things, you know, for only 10 years or only 15 years even. And these are the oldest people in the hobby compared to people who have just started, you know, years or months ago. So there is huge amounts of risks in investing in Pokemon already. So also doing it, you know, blind without proper investigation into this stuff is the most dangerous thing to know like it, it's so so bad to do unless you do put the time in first time is as important as money when you are investing in anything for sure that said if you do want to start investing now that you've done that research i'm going to show you how and where to check card prices the best places to buy and sell and where to help acquire some news and information on the pokemon trading card game so, how to look for accurate card values. PokemonPrice.com is fantastic for graded cards. Um, it has great graphics. It uh, has great detail and links towards uh, previous eBay sold listings, which is awesome. The PSA website I often use for auction prices as well. This can sometimes be a little bit behind the times, but still can give you a nice average price that has gone over the last few years, as well as recent sold listings. Oh, sorry, recent sold prices. So that's something to bear in mind eBay sold and completed items is always a great search that you can do as well uh, while you're using that platform. So that can be a nice indication. Do, of course, be aware, especially in auctions, um, to look at who actually was the winning bidder or if there were, uh, you know, second and third place bids and if they had good feedback. Sometimes shield bidding can be a thing in any investable market. TCG Player as well can be a fantastic resource to look at prices, especially for raw cards. I believe this is a fantastic option for you um, to check out prices. If you're looking to buy and sell yourself, <coughs> that TCG Player and eBay, of course, those are decent options. Amazon, particularly for uh, sealed product, I think is underrated because I believe there's usually more eyes on eBay than there are on Amazon. Uh, so I've sometimes found um, kind of deals because there's been price rises on eBay that haven't quite hit Amazon just yet. 
I've found that for recently, things like Hidden Fates tins, a bunch of other recent products that are just sort of sat on Amazon, and you can try and sometimes take advantage of uh, short-term gains uh, from there. The Facebook Marketplace is oftentimes a thing, as is Instagram. They are a little bit more risky because you don't really have the same sort of buyer protection that you can from eBay, and you don't really have the same sort of feedback ratings that you can have on those sorts of websites. But uh, people like to use these sites because they're not paying eBay fees. Um, so that's always something to bear in mind. You can get a bit of a deal because people aren't adding in um, those eBay price uh, deductions into their sale price. So something to bear in mind. PWCC sell through eBay, but they have their own auction uh, house and heritage auctions as well. It's not only for Pokemon, uh, but all sorts of other collecting categories. So that could be another great place to do some research on other collectible categories for sure. Mercari and Yahoo Japan are great ways to buy Japanese products. A lot of people like uh, Japanese promos, modern Japanese promos, and they sell all sorts on there. Tron Toad as well, they can be fantastic for buying singles if you're looking for buying the collection stuff. And at the same time, supporting your local store is something that I will always advocate, and I believe you can find sometimes decent deals there as well. Uh, they oftentimes have singles in binders, they have product as well, so a wide array in your card stores for sure. Finally, we'll end on Pokemon news and information. Bulbapedia has been an absolutely vital resource when I'm trying to find all sorts of information. Um, they can give you all sorts of set info, um, you can look into pull rates, all sorts of stuff on their website. It really is uh, a huge encyclopedia of knowledge for Pokemon. The E4 forum, I will link in the description as well, down below. Um, I've asked many a question in there and had fantastic reception from all sorts of people and there's just constant flow of information going on and there's a huge backlog of information on there as well from some of the most um, invested collectors in the game, uh, both uh, mentally and uh, in terms of value. And also Poker Beach is a fantastic uh, website that I search most days uh, they have great information on recent product releases, um, so definitely something to, be, uh, to bear in mind. I hope you did enjoy this video, guys. I was hoping to stay unbiased as much as I could throughout the video, um, so hopefully I did a decent job of that. Let me know if there's anything missing from this video that you would like me to answer, and also let me know if you enjoyed this investing style video. This channel isn't predominantly based on this, but it might be something that I look into doing more into the future. I've definitely got some collection-based videos on the way, as I have a bunch of PSA returns coming in, PSA submissions potentially as well that I could start uploading to the channel. So my own personal goals may start becoming a thing on the channel. Just let me know down below. If you do appreciate this video, show it off with a like. Subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching, guys. It has been Joe from Omnipoke, and I will see you in another video tomorrow. Cheers.